Hey everyone, it's the Violet Reality. Hey. My name is Casey Rain. I'm here with Kim Camellia for another episode of Uncovering Prince, your favorite series. The series that tells you everything that you want to know, that we want to know, that everyone wants to know about Prince, the man, the legend. In today's episode, we are here with Hans Martin Buff, or just Buff, as, uh, as he's known, who was the main engineer, the main audio engineer at Paisley Park from 1996 to 2001. Is that right? Is that about right? 2000. 2000. Okay, 96, 2000, and worked on so many amazing albums, uh, including Emancipation, Crystal Ball, The Truth, Raven to the Joy, Fantastic. Um, and right now, if you're wondering where we actually are, we are at Proud Galleries in London, mm -hmm. and we've got this guy behind us. <laughs> right here <laughs> so you probably know that these pictures are pictures of prints taken by steve park and steve did his exhibition right here at the proud gallery late last year uh, we were here for it we hosted the after party for it it was an amazing event and if you're in london you can come down here you can see there's there's a few more all over the walls a few more of steve's pictures and you can actually buy his book picturing prints here as well so if you're in or around london make sure you get down here at some point and, and check it out there's actually loads of cool photos here of david bowie the jacksons the beatles the rolling stones it's it's just a cool place if you're a music fan in general so Let's get into it. We have some, uh, some properly deep questions for you. <laughs> We're going to get right down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> Before we get into the super, super deep questions, we're going to go back all the way to the beginning. So we're taking you on a little trip back in time, but then even further to before you started working with Prince. So there is a rumor that you had the parade album cover painted like over your bed. Is that true? I painted it over my brother's bed. So it's half true. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> a teenager, had a couple of moments where I thought, oh, it's really cool to paint stuff on walls, black and white. And to this day, I think it's my favorite Prince cover, actually. And my brother wanted something on his wall, so I painted. Actually, it was uh, so it's, it was parade, the you know the, uh, the cover as you know it, and then it's purple rain written around the side. How do you know that? Uh, I think your wife mentioned it. In oh, my wife! Thank, <laughs> thank you, Patty. Much appreciated. When did you start working with Prince, and how did that come about? Um, okay, it's kind of a long story. I I moved to Minneapolis completely independent from being a recording engineer, a musician, or or a music person at all um, and I moved there because I had friends there and then I just putzed about for a while and then became a recording engineer eventually and of course I wanted to work for Paisley Park um, but it didn't really work out in the beginning which you know in hindsight was a good deal I think um, many reasons for that I, but I learned a lot before I showed up there and then I once um, I went to a recording school in Minneapolis and I went to a panel there where we talked about how you're a good assistant engineer. That's kind of the traditional way of um, becoming an engineer. You kind of work at a studio and you help the engineers showing up. And um, it was me, another guy from around the corner, and Tom Garneau. I don't know if you know him, but he did a lot of Graffiti Bridge and he mixed uh, the Symbol album, a bunch of others. And he pulled me aside afterwards and he said, I like what you said, so if you ever need help getting a Paisley, I'll help you. And he did. It took a it took a while, but then I started in '95, in early '95, um, as an assistant. And um, you people probably know this, but like uh, Paisley was a proper rentable place for a very long time. Then too, so lots of staff, and there were three people then just for Prince called the Prince Pool, <clears throat> and one of them left, and I was kind of hired at the, at, as the replacement, and it didn't pan out that way, which made me very unhappy at the time but gave me another year to learn the place and stuff. And then in the beginning of 1996, Prince um, let go everybody, the, the new power generation at the time, everybody who worked there, which is the core staff. So there was a guy at the front desk, there was somebody up in the office, and then there was um, his engineer at the time and me. And me, I was really surprised about that. And then um, that summer, I was working on a different project that I actually produced, a local band. And I got a call if I wanted to assist Tom Tucker once again. I did a lot of great mixes specifically for Prince um, on a mix. And I showed up and the place hadn't been used for a while. So I was just completely trying to get the studio ready. Then it turned out that Tom Tucker didn't have time that day. And then Prince came in with Kirk Johnson, then his drummer and, and programmer, and stood behind me, strummed his guitar, and asked if I had time for him that week. 
And I thought about that for a good, I would say, thousands of a millisecond, and I, I went in, and then I worked for him for the next four years. That's how that happened. So during the time that you were working with Prince, it's the aftermath of his fight with Warners. He's, he's left Warners. He's gone independent, um, but still very much at war with them and trying to get his masters back and things like that. At one point during the time that you were there, he mentioned wanting to re-record a bunch of his back catalog um, so that he could license the tracks to, for deals without having to, to go through Warners. Um, did, did anything come of that project aside from 1999, the new master and maybe Purple Medley was part of that, or I don't know. Um, the Purple Medley was before my time. That was mainly the work um, of uh, other engineers. I think Ray Hanfeld and Steve Durkee and Shane Keller worked on that. Um, I don't know what the purpose of that, so I have no background information on that. But yes, there was a lot of talk about re-recording the Masters, and we worked on 1999. Um, and there was one attempt of like a remake of Let's Pretend We're Married. And I know that Morris Hayes did some really cool backing, kind of almost drum and bassy uh, background tracks for that, but that's where that ended. That was really, at least in my day, the end of the re-recording project. Um, by the way, that was really interesting for me doing that 1999 thing. Uh, most people don't know about it and that's probably okay, but there's like this Latin part in it. Um, and I always thought, what a weird idea to stick that in there. And then I got the original tape out to I could listen to it. And there's a Latin part in there. So he didn't, he just, in that version, put it out. But it, it had been thought of before, yeah. So just to clarify, that's a, a Latin percussion part in the original 1999 multi-tracks from recorded in, in 1982. Wow. Possibly played by, possibly played by Sheila then, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Around 1995, uh, there was at one point um, a party at, at Paisley Park where Prince got on the stage and he said that he wanted Dallas Austin to co-produce Emancipation, who obviously was very well known for working with TLC and lots of R&B acts at the time. Um, do you remember like talking about that with him or him saying that he wanted to do that or anything like that? I hadn't heard that, I have to admit. Um, and there's never been a different producer, you know. Um, I heard rumors that it was suggested to him by Arista after Raven to the Joy Fantastic and he just walked out of the room. So it's just not his thing. He did hire, you know, Kirk as a co-producer, uh, mentioned as such, which I don't think hadn't happened before with the exception of Kiss. Um, so, but there was, you know, there wasn't much discussion. I think, um, I mean, the weird thing with Prince was, it's like there wasn't a, there wasn't like a, a linear start finish hookup. It wasn't like with other artists where they go, oh, now we shall make a record. We shall write it. We shall maybe demo it. We'll record it and then we'll be done. Break next record. We just come in every day and we didn't know for what it was. And there were plenty of things that didn't make the cut, you know? I mean, the first day I worked there as his engineer, direct engineer, we did like, I think five songs or started five songs, and one of them to this day is unreleased. The rest is on uh, Emancipation, all of it, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's dive a little bit further into the Emancipation album, which is my most favorite album. <laughs> so I thought you should know that. So yeah, um, we're both really big fans of the song Joint to Joint on there, and we read or we heard that you are as well, and that you were very impressed with the way that that song was constructed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, if I remember correctly, I think that was the last song we did for the album, and it was just, you know, it, it has all these little tricks in there that, that uh, all the tricks he does, like all his funny stuff and the basic, just a groove going through and then the funky bit and then come little sound effects things. And I, for one, I'm, you know, I was a huge fan of the, the crazy funky stuff. I like his, <laughs> this cookie humor, you know, Bob George type stuff. And I figure it kind of goes into that direction. And then it's everything that he did in those days was in there and it was really cool. And he just, there wasn't, you know, for a couple of songs, there was like, okay, hmm, how are we going to do that? And some were just kind of, it just came, kind of came out. And with that, with that one, he really sat down and just got to it. It was kind of, it seemed to me like he knew exactly where I was going for. He didn't communicate it um, and put that in and put the, the 99 samples in there and stuff. 
Um, and then the you know little squeaking door come upstairs to my room, and then actually recording. You don't love me. You you know you're a faker. All that stuff. Was he eating the cereal? Of course he was. <laughs> you know the thing is he recorded vocals uh, mostly by himself, and um, so for those times I would be kicked out, and there was a little lounge where I would hang out, or I had lots of other things to do. As I was alone during my four years, you know there weren't like other people uh, picking up after me, so. Um, You'd get like these intercom calls and Hans A or B in those days. That was the recording studio B. And so he said, um, can you bring me some cereal? <laughs> so I brought him some cereal and then he recorded that and stuff like that. Oh, and there were, that, and, and at, this, at the end, it's really funny now that the, I think the estate put up that website with like the credits yeah. and there are no engineering credits, but well, I'm sure that'll come down the line. I'm not, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm not worried, estate. <laughs> but it says like you know, it's my name is on there as voice talent or something like that, or, or spoken word. That's exactly what it was. I spoke a word. <laughs> and he called me in and he said, um, "Hans, say a word two. So I leaned to the mic and said, "Word two. He said, "Thanks," and that was it. And that's for that I got a credit, and now it's 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 a big credit on the on the website, which really uh, amuses me. So, end of story. <laughs> We've heard that Sleep Around was one of the songs that Prince spent the longest amount of time that you'd ever seen him work on, on one song and that he even had brought in one of R. Kelly's producers to, to work on it, one of his engineers to work on it and couldn't get it, where, couldn't get it to where he wanted to get it for quite some time. And um, why was that? Was, did he see it as, as you know, a potential single in a big song? Because obviously it, he performed it on Oprah as well. And, and he was just, you know, but what took so long? What wasn't he happy with about that song to where it, it took him so long to get it to where he wanted to be? You know, I have to say he never communicated this. You know, there were never like discussions. Ah, I wish that song were more like, you know, it's more like, let's do this, let's do that. Sleep Around is actually one of the ones that we did on the first day that got started on the first day I worked for him. Pretty much exactly 22 years ago, July. Um, and yes, uh, we worked on that, and then uh, I think that was the first one I recorded horns on as well. And then came, in came Peter Mokran, um, who I don't think he produced, but he engineered. Uh, there's a difference; it's really important. And and engineers always go Vroop, because you know production is like the director in in albums, whereas engineers kind of like the cameraman, I guess, guy who brings in the sounds and helps the producer. So anyway, Peter came in and it's totally super funny actually because I didn't know he was coming. And all of a sudden there was this guy and I scrambled to set up his gear, which he said, where's my gear? And I'm like, what gear? So it was like a movie somebody goes in, did somebody send some gear? And I'm like, yeah, that's probably for us. So I set that up. Anyway, Peter's parents, he's, he's from Chicago, but they're of German origin. And his father is from my very small hometown. So I know his cousins and stuff. That was just, that was just kind of mind-boggling. It's like going to Japan and finding someone from a little part of Birmingham. So that's just crazy. Um, and then um, Peter is just, I don't know, he kind of... You know, since Prince did so much himself, he had a very specific way of mixing. Um, and didn't really spend much time on it himself. I think outside from those couple of songs, we really spent a lot of time on that one. And the other one was funny enough, that Sheryl Crow cover on Rave, Every Day is a Winding Road. That took forever too. And then um, other than that, I think the few, few mixes took longer than half a day or so. So really, really quick. So Peter did a very nice, very smooth mix, but he didn't, he wanted something more exciting, I think. And then Peter worked on that for a couple of days. And then Prince said thank you, and then he brought somebody else in. It was actually Caesar Sogby, mm. and a guy named Oh God, it's been a bit long now. Come back again. I would look it up on the um, on the credits. But it's two guys from Miami. They work together at Criteria Studios, um, and are really were really big into you know the Miami Sound Machine way of of life. I don't know if they worked on that, but they did a lot of work down there. So then they worked on that, and then did um, the human body, I think, as well. Okay. Mixed, mixed that on top of it, yeah. Nice. So yeah, that took a long time. I think Sleep Around was like a seven day mix. Wow. Which in itself is it's an unusual for him. And I think if you haven't mixed something after seven days, then 
it needs help or it's done <laughs> or it's done. You know, it's one of the two. Were you surprised that, um, given that he was, uh, he talked so much about emancipation being the album that he was born to make. And there was so much amazing songwriting going on there. Were you surprised that he chose to release the cover as the first single? I think we all were. I mean, um, but once again, there was never discussion about that. And he made sure that the record label also just would follow his wishes. Uh, yeah, I was surprised about that. And, uh, you know, as you know, the, the video is quite in, intense um, and very well done. And he spent a lot of time on that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I did that. Which one would you have chosen? <laughs> Ooh, <There you> go. <laughs> I think I should ask that. <laughs> Out of all three discs. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> all right, that's actually a good one for the audience as well. Yeah. Let's have a question in the interview. Yeah, Which it. one of all the songs on Emancipation would you have chosen as the very first single? God, I don't know. I think that for me personally, I would probably say joint to joint just because of how amazing it is. But then again, like I don't know how well that would have fit in what was popular in the charge at that moment in time in the charge because I wasn't actually alive when it came out. What about you? <laughs> I think some really obvious choices to me would be style. I think that would have done really well. Yeah. I think right back here in my arms would have done really well. Um, somebody, somebody would have done well, but I think there was that remix of it, the live studio mix that has more live instrumentation going on. I, th I always preferred that mix to the album mix. It just seems to be a bit more alive. Um, but there's so many songs on that <laughs> album. I think everybody's going to pick a different one in the comments. I think. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the, the Truth album, the uh, acoustic or mostly acoustic album <laughs> that came with Crystal Ball. I think it's one of the most underrated things in, in Prince's entire catalog. And, um, actually, a lot of a lot of fans never were able to to get it, especially you know people have become fans in recent years because it's been out of print for so long, and even before he passed, it was goes goes for a lot of money. Um, but it is a, a phenomenal record, and I think one of the most poignant songs on there is a track that's called "Come Back," um, which is of course thought to be about the loss of Prince and, and Maite's son. Um, did you work on that track and do you remember what the atmosphere was like when recording that and did he, we know that he didn't talk much, but was it quite difficult when you kind of understood what certain songs were about and the circumstances around them? One, I really don't want to talk about his private stuff too. There wouldn't be much to talk about. He wouldn't, you know, at that point, he didn't really share personal stuff yet. Um, later on he did, and that'll be between me and him forever. But I mean, I, it was, you know, for me as a fan, for example, I was really pissed off when the first album after I left was the rainbow children, because obviously he had a fire under his ass, you know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta realize he could just, he made music every day and he would make that music whether he had something to say or not. It's just what he did. And you would know when something was said. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a beginning part to uh, come back that was never released. And with that, even though I was thinking about it, I'm getting goosebumps. It was just um, four a cappella vocal lines that then went into... And that was deeply personal. That was just crazy. But it's not erased. So... Whenever the re-release party makes it to my time of his career, then hopefully it'll come out because it's just touched me very much. But anyway, you know, the whole album was kind of like that. It just started with uh, him actually recording the truth and don't play me in one go, as you heard on the single, with the spacing, virtually. So to both songs in one go, 20 minutes and then a couple of overdubs and done and then he started with that and then it became obvious that it was going to be an acoustic record and got probably a bit more superficial just kind of fleshing it out with stuff but even the superficial ones are like you know circle of amore and stuff i personally personally like very much so on to a completely different song. The song Welcome to the Dawn was only ever released as an acoustic version, but then some fans remember a more like funkier version that used to be the Holt music for 1-800 New Funk. So do you remember working on that? Uh, we did a couple of versions of that, yeah. And that's the, the was the last one. Right. Yeah. 
It's actually one where I made a huge mistake with the tape machine, just letting you know, but those, those are the things you remember. <laughs> anyway, you didn't notice, so I'm cool. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Uh, there were there were a couple, yeah. There were a couple, and I don't remember what the last one was for the acoustic one. You know, it was always kind of parallel, and there were a couple of really funky sessions during the acoustic one as well. The only result of which being fascination that made it on the album. I don't know if that actually you know belongs there really, whatever. Um, but you know, it always went back and forth, and lots of things that actually. There are two songs of mine that I started, at least, uh, that are on uh, musicology. And one of them happened during during uh, the Truth Times, uh, a million days. Mm -hmm. Wow. There was a day where he recorded by himself. That's actually recorded just oh, my part, at least. Only him, even playing drums and such, which was very rare wow. during my time. Is it the same version on musicology? I'm sure they, they put some bits and bobs on it and mixed it. It certainly sounds better than I remember it, but um, it's the same version, yeah. yeah. So one project that, that fans absolutely love that you worked on is uh, Crystal Ball. It came out in 98 uh, in and is obviously Prince trying to beat the bootleggers by releasing all, all the songs that maybe were circulating in very poor quality and lots of fans had fifth or sixth generation ta dub tapes of lots of songs. Um, <laughs> When, when you were compiling that, when, when Prince and, and you were compiling that project, how was it decided which tracks were going to get pulled up and which ones were, were maybe pulled up and then not selected? And did he ever talk about, you know, because some of those songs were, you know, 15 years old at that, at that point or you know, 10 or 15 years old. Did he talk about any of the memories or recollections of working on those songs originally or who worked on those songs with him or stuff he did with the revolution or talking about you know writing with wendy and lisa and things like that um no not much i mean really it was it was fun for me as a fan of course you know i virtually got a list of, of songs and he opened the vault for me and then i went shopping and it was like it's like one of those little trolleys you have in in uh hospitals and such and i just filled that sucker up and brought it upstairs and then we started transferring it from tape machines to digital, and we did a lot of editing. Uh, I shortened a couple of songs uh, quite a bit, specifically I remember uh, Crystal Ball itself and Days of Wild and Chlorine Bacon Skin and weird, weird stuff like that. Um, and we did, I think we, mix, I, we mixed one or two and did a couple of segues and stuff. Um, but it was a very quick project, it took like two weeks, so it was really easy. And then mastering it took took, took a good while. Uh, we did it together, but uh, we did it together with uh, Brian Gardner. He wasn't there, but uh, we did that then for a couple of days. But he didn't talk about it really, you know. I mean, um, he would when it happened quite a bit that we would take old tapes up, which was one of the real the perks of my job. Uh, in the day, for example, they would um, Morris Hayes would trigger a certain like background vocal uh, samples or strings from the originals during the live show. He would play them on keyboard. So I was the guy who got to remix all those old songs and just make submixes of the background vocals and whatever and give it to him and then he could load it into a sampler. Um, so that was pretty awesome in itself. But then, you know, Prince every once in a while he would come up and make some comments. I remember him saying, I once said pop live up and we soloed the background vocals and it was Wendy and Lisa. And they sound identical. And he said, they're one person. They really are one person. Uh, he was very proud, I think. And I, there were a couple of comments, actually about a song I'm not going to tell you about that didn't make it onto uh, Crystal Ball, which is actually quite amazing. It, it was a well-known song by another 80s pop star that he actually did a new backing for, mm -hmm. that he was asked to, was never released. And he commented how the stars, people were just partying to it. Uh, never happened. And I remember him looking at some of the credits, and he once had a, a an engineer called Coke Johnson. So he he made he told a couple of stories about Coke Johnson. That was his real name, and and blah blah blah. blah. So just a little uh, pitter and patter. But the most memories are really um, he wrote all those uh, uh, liner notes that are in there. So there you have it. Yeah. That's that's really it for that.
and one of the things I did at Paisley Park was I typed stuff. Um, it was one of the difficult things there is if he, he would ask you, can you do blub? And if you were care careless enough to say yes, you do it for the rest of your time there. So I've typed all the credits, I've typed all the lyrics <laughs> afterwards and all that stuff because I can type. Um, so he read all that stuff to me and I typed out the stuff for the crystal ball. All right. So I need One thing that, that has been mentioned um, a couple of times and I'm not sure if it's ever been mentioned by anyone that, that worked on it or if it's just sort of rumor or hearsay, but we know that around the same time that Prince was working on Crystal Ball, he was also planning uh, Roadhouse Garden and to get you know, this revolution, all these old revolution songs. And, uh, and, and one thing that's been mentioned is that he specifically left songs like Splash off of Crystal Ball because he was planning to include those on Roadhouse Garden. Do you remember any of the sort of activity around Roadhouse Garden or if any of the revolution members coming to Paisley to, to talk about it or, or anything like that? I think you overestimate the communication that he had artistically. Um, he wouldn't talk to, Ro to revolution people. That was his music as far as he was concerned. There was one song which is now out but was my favorite bootleg ever, which was Wonderful Ass. And that was, that was the one revolution song I remember that was supposed to make it onto Crystal Ball. Um, and that was left off. And then we actually did, wrote, we started Roadhouse Garden. I got another list uh, with songs. Splash was among them and uh, Roadhouse Garden. That came out of the vault. And then, but we only worked on that for like two days. In, but my, many years later, actually, we did that in uh, 99. We worked on that. And I'm personally glad he didn't do it. Because what we actually did, we, I remember Roadhouse Garden actually being transferred the mix being transferred to tape and then he started doing overdumps. Yeah. yeah. So, well, actually that's one of the amazing things about Prince. I think is that he could just pull stuff out of the vault and he would never know that it was from earlier. I mentioned just from my time, um, a million days. And then later on this, uh, if I was the man in your life, two, two completely different projects pulled out for another project and you wouldn't know that it's from a different time. Um, rave unto the joy fantastic it was all new with the exception of the title song where nothing I could be wrong maybe that was an, uh, an up to an uh, overdub or two but I only remember pulling it out and mixing it the same day and be done with it so mm -hmm. and it sounds like it was recorded the same day as the rest so that's pretty impressive to me so moving on to uh, another album that's a favorite of ours is Raven to the Joy Fantastic. Uh, I thought it was a great project. I thought it was really cool that, you know, these collaborations were happening with people like Eve and Chuck D and, um, and Gwen Stefani. And um, I, I really love that album. I think it's a fantastic album. But it seems like the uh, kind of ideas that Prince and, and Clive Davis had in mind for it, the whole project seemed to sort of sour quite quickly after it came out. And, and then of course, a year or so later, Prince put out the rave into the joy, fantastic remix CD. And he's kind of like saying, this is better. This is, this is better than what we did for that one. So ignore that one. And this is how it should have been done. And, and kind of, kind of like giving a massive middle finger to Clive Davis and that whole deal. Um, what, what went wrong in your opinion? Well, I have a question for you guys first. Is there any Prince album you don't like? Say yes or no, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> no, I'm just, I mean, I'm very happy about that because, you know, I mean, part of the deal is, and uh, that's been mentioned before, I'm a bit self conscious that I'm kind of the engineer in the period that is kind of between um, the massive flight and between the god rock star and then the rebel music traveler and so i'm kind of in the middle so and that's kind of partly answering your question i think one of the problems the man had prince that is is that he wanted to be justin timberlake and frank zappa at the same time and you kind of you got to choose you can't have both or you, you can't be upset that your frank zappa stuff isn't received as you know current pop stuff and I think that's what he tried to do, you know. I mean, once again, what Clive Davis had in mind, I don't know what he had in mind. I mean, uh, he called on a regular basis and he made some suggestions and Prince did what he always did. He did what he did. And I'm sure it was inspired, I'm actually qu quite certain it was inspired by Santana's success with his duets. 
and it was great for me. It was, I mean, in terms of working with the man, it was the best year. It was just, he was, it was great. It was great times. We got along well. He was respectful. Um, all these cool people showed up, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, what went wrong? I think, I think it was a combination of things. Part of it is timing. Um, and part of it is um, a thoroughness of intention. I mean, what he did, I, I thought too that he could have had with Rave what he's later had with musicology had he pulled the same stops. Meaning, from the outside, I have no information on musicology work from the inside, but he did that Grammy thing and there were good videos before the video, before the single came out and there was a promotional push and whatever, but it just didn't come across around like that. And also musicology, at least in my book, um, is more, is, is assembled more like a Prince, look, this is Prince album rather than I'm trying to be hip album, yeah. you know? So there were a couple of things on, on Ray that I really liked. Uh, I've stated before, I really liked uh, um, uh, Strange But True. Oh, that took a while. Um, because there was actually a Lindrum, it was a couple of keyboards and nothing. And actually took, it took some convincing by Manuela, his later wife and myself, for him to actually put it on there. But then he wouldn't put it on there without doing a couple more overdubs, those weird scratchy things and the beep, beep, beeps things and whatever. <laughs> and it was perfect without... It was just, you know, three things and going. So he wasn't there yet to just let it rock and be like, you know, a band album or just a funk thing. And there are a couple of things that then later came out um, on the um, Welcome to the Slaughterhouse compilation and the other one, what is it called again? Chocolate Factory. Chocolate, uh, Factory. Um, that were made for that album and didn't end up on that album. Right. And what I like, for example, why can't I do that when I can do this, for example? that it's just like Pretty Man and that you could have, could have, would have, should have. It was a fun album to make. It's unfortunate it didn't go any further. And it's even more unfortunate, by the way, just, you know, thinking about the freedom that he got after the Warner thing, mm -hmm. that the albums we did, the really nice albums, really hard to get, you know, unless you go on Tidal and, and stream it. But, you know, the Warner stuff you can get just fine. All the other stuff you really have to dig for. Bummer. I'm ready to remaster it if you want me to. <laughs> yes. I'll help you. I'll tell every story. Estate, yeah, estate. I'll tell the stories for you. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. We'll talk. We'll talk. So I feel like with the 90s stuff, a lot of people that are my age, so like in there, like from like 16 to about 21, 25, these are the people that actually really take like their liking towards the 90s print stuff rather than all of the 80s stuff. And for us, it was super, super hard to find rave and emancipation and whatnot in stores. So we're really looking forward to that. But yeah, I think it's really interesting for these people as well to hear the stories that are not just Prince in the 80s when he was basically at his like artistic high and like super, super world frame and whatnot but like also like Prince in the 90s where he was like had this creative freedom and like all those kind of things really interesting to hear for us so yeah <laughs> just My wanted pleasure. to say that yeah, <laughs> appreciate cool. that yeah what was it like working with people like George Clinton and Chaka Khan awesome <laughs> um, well George Clinton just showed up and the one thing we did uh, uh, for something that was related, uh, released, I think about 10 years later, Paradigm. Paradigm. It was just, he sent a tape. So that was cool. It was a cool track to work on. I remember that vividly because I transferred the tape and did some stuff and then Prince came in and said, any good? I'm like, I said the second, he sent two, I don't remember the first one. I said, the second one's pretty good. So he listened to it and said, that's awesome. What are you saying? I'm like, I said, it's good. <laughs> I got to keep you a bit longer. I said, that's fine. So, so we, we, he worked on it for like four hours and a lot of fun putting that stuff on. The paradigm background. It was a really quick, quick, quick deal. Uh, Shaka Khan was a whole album and she's an awesome lady. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, I think that was the toughest time in terms of relationship between me and Prince. Mm. She was kind of in a bad mood in those days, it seemed like, and at least towards me. Um, but she was awesome. Great, great uh, spirit. Am amazing singer. I remember her, uh, I actually rented a specific mic because I thought it would be perfect for her vocals without asking him, which later on was like, where's that mic you had? I rented it. Mm. 
Let's rent it again. You know, so we had that for a long time, that mic. And um, anyway, I set it up, and then we needed just kind of a sound check just for level. And she didn't even stand in front of the mic. She, you know, the mic was like here. And she just leaned on one of the gobos and twiddled with her hair and went, Bleh! and she's, we both went <laughs> in the control and going, my God, the power is with us. Uh, great, great family stuff. And um, also, interestingly enough, he kind of uh, polished the sound a bit more. So a lot of the songs were mixed by Tom Tucker, who was a very good engineer and very much that smooth sound of the 90s man. I had that down pat. Uh, it was good times too, working with him and uh, Ricky Peterson, uh, who is one of the most funny people I know. I uh, haven't seen him in a very long time. Hey, Ricky. Um, uh, anyway, that was good. The same with uh, Larry Graham, which was completely uh, parallel, really. We heard that uh, that George was exempt from the no meat policy at Paisley Park. <laughs> I want to know where you know the stories from. Okay, admit it, tell me, and I'll, I'll tell you. Ah, uh, Griff, yes. I can't, can't believe he remembers that. Yes, we all were, you know, I'm, to this day, I out myself as a meat eater. Uh, and even then I was, but we weren't allowed to eat meat in the place, which we didn't necessarily follow because it's in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I'm like, if you provide vegetarian catering, yes, I will not eat meat. But in came George Clinton and his son with a humongo a uh, bucket of KFC chicken wings walked into the kitchen where Prince was saying, hey dude, or whatever he said, and put it on the table and proceeded to eat it. And we were all like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Very good. He did, uh, there was a, this is actually Takumi's story, uh, uh, the guitar tech. He'll um, forgive me for saying it. Takumi had strict uh, direction to not let anybody touch Prince's cymbal thing guitar. And Shaka Khan came over when they were on tour together and asked Takumi if she could add all that guitar once. And he said, I'm really sorry, Shaka, but he told me nobody. And then later Prince came around and said, nobody says no to the queen. <laughs> so telling Takumi whatever she wants, she can, she, she can do it. So. I just want to backtrack a little bit because there was another emancipation question that I, uh, that I forgot to <laughs> ask before. <laughs> we're, we're sort of going chronologically. We might, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you you may actually may not know this at all because I don't I don't know if this is a song that you worked on, but I've always wondered why on my computer Kate Bush's vocals are so low in the mix. You can't hear her at all. <laughs> I think you can hear her quite well, actually. Um, I did work actually specifically on those vocals uh, or on mixing mixing them in. Um, we got a tape back, and I think it was he had just sent her the mix of my computer, which I had not recorded. And she sent her however many vocals. I think it may have actually just been a two-track uh, sub-mix. And we just put them up in the right spot and off you go. I mean, she just does... I think she's quite loud in the end, actually. Maybe I just need to listen to it differently. I don't know. I just, I just don't... I don't uh, I'm a big Kate Bush fan as well, and I just don't... Something I don't really hear her like clearly. Um, but it, it's like that. It's not. She doesn't. It's not a duet thing. She yeah. really. She did yeah. backings, yeah. and it's it's in there. And we, it, it was a lovely moment. Very yeah. awe-inspiring. And I actually met last year Stephen, who is her engineer now, who's out at Real World. Lovely guy. Yeah, I'd love to meet her. Did you do any work on the seven CD new funk sample set that never came out? Lots of it. Oh. <laughs> That's where that pop uh, live episode happened. We, so we put all that stuff out. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail too much, but I don't think he... He, he didn't fully real. I mean, one of the funny things was is when I had an opinion which was based in my professional experience that he didn't like, he just ignored me. Like, for example, there was... <laughs> there was once a meeting with the whole staff except for me. And I didn't know what it was about. I had stuff to do. I didn't care. And then it turned out it was about reopening the studio, <laughs> which is uh, virtually the only guy that had anything to do with that out of all the people that sat in there. There was all the live crew and whatever. And it was kind of like that, um, that a couple of us tried to tell him um, how much there needed to be on a, you know, that's like thousands of samples, you know, and if you have seven of those, that's just going to be a gazillion freaking samples. 
But for a while there, we pulled up all the uh, old tapes and we virtually took little wiki wiki wicks and little snare bits. And of course, we all, <laughs> especially Morris Hayes and I pulled out stuff that we wanted to have. <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite things, for example, is the uh, the drum bit that he did for Release It on, on the Graffiti Bridge. So I tried to push that in there, so if it comes out, I can sample it legally. <laughs> and then he figured out that, you know, if you the point behind a sampler CD is really everybody can use it yeah. as much and for whatever they want. Yeah. And I, th I think that's what made it die, the death it died. And it's a good thing, though. But for a while, we pulled that stuff out and... I would put them on, on DATS and uh, we'd have little workstations set up in a huge conference room and everybody was put to work, the drum tech, whatever, cutting stuff out and uh, getting some noisy stuff out. Um, yeah. I think it would have been, if it, you know, it's made for professional people yeah. who would pay a lot of money for it and not forgiving f for um, the charming things that are cool when you just record a song. Um, so I'm very glad it never happened. I don't know if you know this, but just before uh, Morris Hayes stopped working with Prince, uh, and he stopped working with him around the Third Eye Girl era when that started, so about 2012, 2013, but just before that he was at NAMM, and there's an interview with him at NAMM, and, he's, and they ask him, what are you working on at the moment? And he says, the seven CD sampler set for Prince. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that, but I'm, once again, I'm glad it didn't happen. Um, you know, Prince had his very own way of working, and I'm very grateful for that because otherwise I would have never gotten the chance. You know, you, I was uh, uh, 27 at the time, and I was uh, three years out of recording school, and I don't think I was bad or untalented, but I certainly had, had no place with one of the huge stars of the world. And the reason I got that gig is because um, he just did that. He gave people chances and see if, you know, he could mold them um, because he had his very own way of recording. He just, and whenever we did something else, you know, whenever he said, oh, this sounds really cool, like, you know, that mix with Peter Mokren, who's was a great mixer and great producer. So what he did was great, just to point that out again on Sleep Around. It just wasn't Princess, you know. He had these very distinct uh, things that he thought were essential to a good sound, and they, there wasn't like a theory, field theory behind it, but... Uh, whenever he got in contact with the real recording world, it was kind of sobering, I think, for him. Slash, I don't want to do that. My stuff is good as I want it to have. Um, he was really unsentimental about that anyways, about uh, audiophile approach to stuff. So once again, I'm very happy that didn't happen. Uh, those samples didn't come out, even though I would have loved to have them, of course, some of them. Not, I, you know, why would you need a sample of a Lin? Uh, I can... I have several of those, not from him, but they always sound like they sound. But, you know, I really, I would have liked that, uh, that uh, whole uh, release it bit and a bunch of other things, of course, yeah. But I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't have put those out. Are there any specific songs that you worked on that you're really surprised about that they never actually came out? Yes. Or they came out in the form that they did. For example, there was a song called She Gave Her Angels, which ended up on crystal ball and a very truncated version. I thought that was one of the highlights of Emancipation because we worked on that a lot. Mm. And I think that would have really benefited from a Tom Tucker mix and some real strings and whatever. That was just a huge uh, song, I thought. Like Bohemian Rhapsody huge. Oh, that I am surprised that didn't come out. You know, a lot of them came out on those two compilations, the Chocolate Invasion and the Slaughterhouse bit. And uh, on 2010, there was one that we did. Um, um, Future Soul Song, it was called. Oh, that's an old song. Oh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, that Future Soul Song. It's been a bit long now, sorry for... I need to think about the name of the songs. Um... I can't really say. I can't really say there are any specific ones that I'm surprised they didn't come out. I'm more surprised about the emphasis he put on some of the songs that did come out. Like you questioned earlier about why is Bitch by Golly now the first single of Emancipation with those, this wealth of incredible songs. 
uh, both the au courant, you know, pop ballad, pop R&B ballad type, and the funky stuff and whatever. Same with other songs, like, you know, why would that cover of Sheryl Crow be on Rave? Or why did he think uh, Silly Game or something needed to be on there? Actually, he explained that one to me. I remember why. Because he asked, what should we get off? What would you get off? <laughs> and, I don't know if I should say this here, but it was pretty funny. It was... Uh, uh, the Sun, the Moon, and Stars. I think that was my least favorite on that record. <laughs> and we sat in the editing room, and he asked, so which song do you think should go? And I'm like, I know I'm going to regret this, but The Sun, the Moon, and Stars. And he goes, Hans, how's your sex life? <laughs> meaning, meaning that's the one for the ladies. And he would think about it that way, which also taught me a lot. And actually, when I do workshop these days, I pass on how important the sequence is. You know? Um, but I wouldn't have. I would have taken completely different songs. And we, you know, it kind of came in phases and there were a lot of songs from, in the phases before the final rave phase that could have been on there. Uh, for example, um, So Far So Pleased wasn't at first with, uh, with Gwen Stefani, it was with somebody else. And he, we did, there were a couple of rock songs that were really cool. Um, he did, uh, th there was a cover of You're Still The One by Shania yeah, Twain, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that was really good. Um, and that was the same period of Be as Beautiful Sh Strange, for example. So, you know, if the album would have gone more that way, I would have been happier personally. But um, there aren't really that many out where I say, wow, I don't have any Wally stories, you know, where it's like, oh, this is the great <laughs> lost song that will never be uh, type stuff. Yeah, but why he put out what he put out is much more of a mystery to me. But it also shows, you know, if you look at the crystal ball from a fan perspective, for me as a fan, I would have not chosen remixes of stuff from an album from two years ago that maybe wasn't his best work to begin with or whatever it is. Um, speaking of sun, moon and stars, and I think um, th there is a sort of a, a, a section in the fan base that just they're not interested in. Uh, you know, anything that Prince did that was hip hop. And I loved the hip hop stuff he did. I thought it was, some of it was great, like Acknowledge Me and stuff like that. I, was, I loved it. But for me, like Prince and reggae-ish type stuff was just not the one. Like Sun, Moon and Stars is, yeah, Blue Light is not one of my favorites either. But there is a very early song that he did. And I don't know if he ever pulled it back out of the vault because I think it was at one point considered for Crystal Ball 2 that never happened. But there's a, there's a sort of reggae-ish song that he did in about 81, 82 called If It'll Make You Happy. Do you know that one? No. Well, that, that one is the only one that I think he did reggae actually quite well. <laughs> and it kind of sounds like The Police. Um, okay. So it was, it was pretty cool. But, but yeah, hip-hop stuff that he did I thought was great. But some people don't, <laughs> some people don't dig it. I think it's also like a personal preference kind of thing, yeah. you know, because some people are really into hip hop, some people are really into ballads, some people would be like, oh, I would have picked that and then that, but yeah, it's really interesting how like everybody has like different opinions of what they would have wanted to see on like different stuff. Uh, well, that's it, that's actually the interesting thing about it, yeah. you know, I've, I've said this before where uh, what really amazes me is that people usually like his stuff that is not the stuff they usually like. So if you're a hip-hop dude, you don't like his hip-hop stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're a reggae dude, you don't like his reggae stuff. If you're a keyboarder, you think he's a great guitarist. And if you're a guitarist, you think he's a great keyboarder. He just kind of went for it. And to be quite honest, I mean, um, there were just a couple of things he just couldn't do. Um, he, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the Let's Pretend We're Married drum and bass mm -hmm. hookup. I think that was just the whole, when it gets too repetitive and too um, animalistic, for lack of a better word, that was just not musical enough for the dude. So we just didn't understand that it's not about yeah. cool breaks and little licks. It's about just yeah. go all the way through, you know? Um, so I agree with you, but there's so much stuff out there. I mean, it's interesting for me that they're now releasing that solo piano thing with all yeah. the, all the things that they could release. Good for them. Do you uh, remember working on the, there was talk that Prince and Maite wanted to do a children's album called Happy Tears and that uh, maybe she gave her angels was at one point for that. Um, obviously that when he went on the Muppets and did a re-record of, of Starfish and Coffee, maybe that was part of like the same kind of vibe. Do you remember that project particularly? 
I don't remember a children's album. I know they started working on a children's book with Steve, so you have to ask him about that. Um, and then I'm sure that uh, Muppet Show thing had something to do with uh, the baby. Um, and that was fun. That was one of the funnest gigs of my life. So we r recorded the basics for all those songs on the Muppet Show. She gave her angels actually being one of them. There was just wasn't, there wasn't enough uh, time for it. And there was one, I don't think that was in the show either, 1799, where the skit would have been that he was in Mozart gear. Right. And then to 1800 party over, oops, out of time. Tonight we're going to party like 1799. And so there were uh, basic tracks uh, cut at Paisley, and then we went to LA, and uh, I actually met Gonzo, the actual, and stuff like that. And I recorded all those Muppet people going, let's go crazy, and stuff. <laughs> that was awesome. You said something in an interview that you did that was in German that we translated about, about, about a Hebrew version of Jam of the Year. Is that a joke or a real thing? Uh, that's a bad translation. No, it's not a bad translation. <laughs> it's a real thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's not a real version. Somebody came by and uh, <laughs> it was good for the moment to do a Hebrew version of Jam of the Year. Just the line, ooh, everybody's here, this is the Jam of the Year. Let's do an international version, and that was as far as it got. One thing that's quite consistent with people that worked um, at Paisley Park is that the turnover of staff was pretty high. Uh, lots of people didn't last very long. Um, do you ever remember that anyone was, was let go or dismissed that you felt they shouldn't have been or they were treated unfairly? Because I remember that... I think Chronic Freeze, the engineer, said that he felt he was let go over a misunderstanding. Um, did you ever feel like that with anybody that, that was there one day and, and gone the next? I do think that that's Dave Friedlander, right? Uh, I'm his replacement. So uh, I know the story from a couple of angles, and I do think he was let go unfairly. Um, but... I don't know how deep I want to go into that, but there, every once, generally he kept pretty good people around. Every once in a while there were some people who were in it for the status and blatantly abused it. I mean, we all were in it a bit for the status, to be completely honest. You know, we all knew if we leave, we're leaving this, being part of this behind, but that's not what I mean. Some people were in it for personal power placement and they by putting blame on other people or uh, just being incompetent. Got people in trouble that shouldn't have been, that were straight up with uh, their, their can-dos and can't-dos, um, which is something I respect anyways. But mostly people were around, I, was, I had a good time, you know, there were a couple of hot seats um, and they were filled with people that lasted for an amazingly long time. Takumi being one of them. Guitar texts were uh, quite frequent for a while, especially before my time. And with Takumi, I think he was there for 10 years. So, wow, yeah. I really respect the fact that people could come in, in in one capacity and Prince would give them the opportunities to do different things. So, like for example, Griff came in as a lawnmower and then three years later he has his artwork on the floor in the game room and being sold on tour and Prince is asking him if he can shoot photos and you know, even you know, Steve did not start out as a you know, photographer. And, and uh, you know, did Prince ever ask you to, to do something outside of being an engineer and you were just like, no, I'm not doing that, I can't do that, I don't want to do that or anything like that? Well, several things actually. Um, I was, like I said, I was uh, careless with typing and... Uh, I think even then I was quite aware of what I couldn't do. Um, and one of the things he asked me to do was go on tour with him. And I know a lot of engineers, studio engineers have that. And I, the, you know, this is a bit nerdy now, but there is a, it, it's a different game. It's, I always compare it like a dentist and a psychiatrist. They're both medical people, but you wouldn't go to either one with your sore throat or, you know, you wouldn't mix it up. And you just need a, a whole different level of expertise to do it. So he asked me to do that and I just, just said no. And the band made fun of me because they knew, you know, I mean, that's also the only time I had off. So if he was on tour, that was the time when I would sleep <laughs> for a while and hang with my wife, who's very nice. Um, 
Um, no, I was always straight up. And I think he appreciated that, even though, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes when he really wanted to do something that I thought was a stupid idea, I would bring that to him. There was a chance. Like, he wanted to reopen the studio, and I wrote a memo this long. <laughs> and he came in, what do I want me to do with this? Just let me know what you want. And I said, okay, not now, he said. <laughs> so he fucked off. And then what happened a lot was... Um, that I would bring a CD of what we'd done that day to his house after work. I would just bring that around and leave it at the guardhouse and I'd write little messages on the cover. So in one sentence, I said what I said about studios. Uh, and it didn't come to pass. So, But there were a lot of things where uh, people were put into positions that they shouldn't have. And it it's kind of, you know, I think in a way, in a way that was kind of a strange way to keep people to, because when you show up there as a receptionist and all of a sudden you're the, the, his personal assistant, then you think you're a personal assistant if you don't watch out. And then you get out of Paisley Park mm -hmm. and people go, so what's your experience? And you go, well, I was a personal assistant for six weeks for Prince, yeah. meaning I made his calls for him or whatever it was. Uh, you won't get anywhere. You'll be a front guy again. So mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that, but it plays with people's heads. So, yeah. so it seems that um, around the turn of the millennium, it, it was a major turning point for Prince because in the space of two years, he's not with Mighty anymore. He's married Manuela. Um, he's, he's getting a lot more into being a Jehovah's Witness. He's backed off from working with majors after Rave. Uh, and he's let, and a lot of people have, have, have left around this time. You know, Steve Park left and, and Griff left and you know, a few other people had left. And, and you left around that time as well. Was it very clear that the atmosphere was changing? You know, Prince getting more into being you know, Jehovah's Witness and after losing his, uh, his father as well. Was it, did it change the kind of the vibe and the atmosphere around Paisley? And, and was there a link, I guess, between a lot of the people choosing to leave around that time? You know, I don't want to speak for the others, but um, I can I can speak for myself. It was pretty for me. The rave year was pretty cool, and then the show, for example, um, at the end of the year, which then ended up on the DVD and was on TV and stuff, was really cool because that was the one time where he just let me do whatever. They would rehearse, and I would just sit in there and sound check and hook stuff up and get ready for it, and then. He even said once, "Is like I better come in and check it out. Ah, better not, because he'd you know get do everything then." And so he just sat back and let me do my thing. And I knew it wasn't going to get any better. And it was pretty clear, pretty quick afterwards that uh, it was just whoop, new chapter. And it wasn't that deep, you know. It wasn't like ah, oh, I'm not doing major. I mean, he worked with majors afterwards and uh, and stuff, uh, and he didn't work with majors before. Uh, I don't think that was really it, but just, I think the Jehovah's Witness thing made a gentle entrance in my time uh, in the form of Larry Graham, who's a wonderful man, and his wife is, too, you know, he was a, he was just a ray of sunshine in that place. He was, he was one of those people, you know, treat me no different than he would Prince, you know, which in itself, I think, is a sign of a good person. So, uh, um, if that rubbed up off in the form of being of his ch church of choice on Prince, more power to both of them. But it was more like, okay, I've now tried this, the duet thing with the blah and going that route. Um, whoop, stop. And it wasn't like a sudden stop either. You know, it wasn't like, okay, I'm never doing that again. So once again, there wasn't any communication, any blow up of any kind. But it was obvious to me that it just, he didn't want to continue as it was and that concurred with my personal um, state of mind, which was like, okay, it doesn't get any better than that. Now what? How do I get out of this? Or what? how, how is this going to represent itself or whatever? And uh, I think the one thing I really regret is not leaving six months earlier because then it would have been a completely clean, I need to do a new thing. And I think it was nasty when I left. But it was it was clear there was time for both of us. 
and Femi was around, who was a great engineer, and he was good for the new start. He was in, he was in, he hadn't seen it all over and over again, you know. And uh, just to clarify why I thought it was a new chapter, you know, we did stuff like uh, the Radical Man mm. and the Peace Song. That was like one of the first things. And then working on that stuff for uh, that ended up, there was supposed to be a, an album called High. That's like a combo of, of stuff that I did and Femi did. It was like kind of crossover stuff. And uh, that ended up once again on those compilations, most of it. Um, and that just seemed like more of the same, but b because I can, and he seemed not very happy with that, you know. And it was very preachy, I thought. So that just came in. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's really it. I don't know why all the others left. I th I do think that there was just a closing of a chapter, and that that does uh, go hand in hand with the people you work with. You know, I mean, you have to realize he kind of had his own little tribe hooked up, and once you were in that, you were the ring between him and the outer world too. Like I had uh, Clive Davis, one of the founders of the rock music industry, on the phone begging me to do something that, and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on, but I'm not the guy calling the shots here. So, meaning if you have a new chapter, you need a new ring too. So that's perfectly okay. Uh, not long before you, you left, you did an interview on Prince's website at the time, the Love for One Another website, and uh, somebody asked you about your favorite unreleased Prince song, and you said, Actually, you already mentioned it in this interview. You said the first one I recorded on the first day with Prince, and I'll let the fans know when it comes out. <laughs> but uh, it never came out. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what kind of song it was and what it sounded like? Um, it was like hymnal. It was hymnal. It was actually one of those. Uh, it was kind of like a. It was kind of like we march, only uh, a bit more gospely, I guess. I tell you, whatever. It's called the divine. Oh, it's the divine. End of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he mentioned it a few times in interviews over the years. Yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah, he said, I think it had to be late, maybe 2009, 2010 even. He's doing an interview and uh, the reporter says something like, he plays the first few chords of a song called The Divine and then stops playing it and says, you aren't ready for this or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like something like that. Yeah. But yeah, the, he, he mentioned the song by name a few times. So that's, that's really cool that that's, uh, that's the same song. Yes. Awesome. Maybe uh, Estate again. <laughs> you know, if you're watching, you know what we want. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Given the importance that Prince placed on Emancipation as a project when he was doing it, and saying things like, this is the album I was born to make, and this is my freedom, and this, that, and the other. He, uh, it's pretty notable that in the last kind of 10 years or so, very few songs of it got played live ever. The only notable exception is The Love We Make. He pretty much played The Love We Make until the end, basically. It came up a lot. Oh, really? Yep. First day as well. The Divine and The Love We Make, the same day. There you go, fact checkers. Uh, <laughs> But do you think that the sort of circumstances around how much the album, how much of the album was basically you know, a love letter to Maite and, and their wedding and you know, her and, and the baby and all that stuff, do you think it kind of tainted the whole project in his mind and he kind of sort of pushed it out a little bit and didn't want to do those songs that he associated with that time frame? Dude, I, re I really can't tell you that. I mean, you know, you could say the same thing about Gold. I mean, you know, I think there was, as a fan, I thought there was a great record. So why is he not playing stuff of that? You know, I Hate You or or the funky stuff or whatever it is, you know, the rock stuff. I thought it was a great record. Um, I would turn it around. I was happy to see on certain playlists that he would play stuff from the truth, you know, uh, other side of the pillow and stuff like that. And... Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask him and the people around him at the time. But I don't think he soured particularly on things. I think he was. Um, it's kind of was. I was hinting at earlier with with the song choices for the Crystal Ball and the remix being on the same page as these just uh, uh, fan treasures like an honest man and Crystal Ball and all those things. Your last heart and stuff. 
And um, I, I don't think for him there was a, a quality difference or an importance difference between now and whenever. It was all fabulous, you know. So put it all together and put it out. It wasn't like, oh man, clear the attic. It wasn't about that. It was like, wow, look what I can do. I personally think I was very proud of emancipation. I am still, and I haven't heard, and actually, I just heard it um, a couple of weeks ago because I stayed at a friend's house and he put it on. It was like, boom, no go. <laughs> the storm of, of uh, audible memories coming over me. I thought I was well put together too, you know. I mean, you can listen to every record, every one of the three by itself, and it'll be just fine. It seems to have a, th you know, a theme for each one of them, yeah. you know. Kind of life, love, and and liberty, if you will, what should be, or what you know. This is not from him, so not according to Buff. Uh, blah. He said that it's not what it is. It's just that was my thing. It's I liked it. Um. And I don't know how much they fit into any other context. So maybe that's just hard to kind of pull apart and do stuff, you know. Um, and I did about a third of that album, and the rest was really pulled together from um i think i think some of it uh, that was at, at least originally on it was from as early as diamond and pearl's time so it was kind of to me that was like the full stop of a certain period they didn't yeah. play much to begin with i mean he didn't play for stuff from come or the symbol album very much did he or there you go there, there you go just going there did he play anything from rave Oh, and he played the one, you know. I mean, uh, which is, which is the first album, the song we did after Emancipation, after that was out. So it is very much a my taste song. So that doesn't seem to stop him. It's really interesting to try and find out, you know, the, the certain, certain stories behind certain songs, or try and get a, a little bit of insight because. Even when you sometimes get a bit of information, and particularly if it has to do with other people, and then there's always still like a gap between, even when there's other people speak on it. So for example, like in Emancipation, you've, one of my favorite songs is uh, In This Bed I Scream. And in the, in the liner notes, he's saying, this is dedicated to Wendy and Lisa. And in the lyrics, he's like, oh, why did our relationship break down and blah, blah, blah. And then <laughs> they spoke on it and they were like, well, you never attempted to have a relationship with us after the revolution broke up. So why are you doing this 10 years later and saying you miss it, but you actually haven't tried. So it's, I don't know. It's, it's weird to try and get into his head. And like, sometimes you wonder if like he, him writing a song is like, he feels like that's enough to try and have a relationship with somebody. And maybe for him it was, and he just had to get it out there. But I think with emancipation being so long, it's, there's just so much, so many untold stories that hopefully you know, over the years, we'll, we'll get a little bit more insight into. You know, I'd be very surprised about it. I think uh, a lot of things were too... You know, the, the, the fewest of the songs that, he was, that, that were started when he would come in and start a song were ones where it was obviously he wrote it at home or he sat down and was like, oh, cool, this is a song. They would just kind of grow out of musical moments in the studio. So I wonder how many of those explanations were just kind of attached to it afterwards as a cool little aside. And uh, he was, I think he was well aware of how the machine works. So stuff like the album he was born to make, I don't know. I mean, it, it didn't run around with us saying, dang, that's the best album I ever made. I was born to make this album, Hans. It didn't work that way. So I think he made music, he put it together, he was immensely proud of it. And, um, as for the relation, you know, I wonder too a bit because um, I didn't have a, I obviously had a completely different and much smaller part in his life than Wendy and Lisa did. But he had kind of this forbidding attitude once you were out of his orbit. And maybe that was just Maybe that should have been ignored more, you know? I mean, that's certainly something that would have been worth attempting just to say hi. Yeah. I know Griff did that once, and apparently that didn't go too well. But, uh, um, yeah, you know, you don't want to 
you don't want a what do you want here thing either because you've given so much and that's just kind of a letdown but anyway what i'm saying is he was a guy and uh i'm sure there was you know uh, real fondness even if it wasn't appreciated uh, or or uh, expressed as such real fondness there was kind of a fatherly pride or whatever of the people around him which is i'm sure one of the reasons why we all got to do stuff we weren't hired to do but because he wanted us around and he needed it done you know I'm an expert popcorn maker because of that, for example. <laughs> so, I turn him on to coffee, too. <laughs> Lots of honey, people, if you want to recreate it. Yeah, soy milk. There. Yes, yes, we're all about the soy milk. <laughs> so, would you mention in going into the fault, can you tell us a little bit more about whether the fault was really in a very poor condition, you know, around the time that you were there, if it was already in that sort of state, and what's your opinion on them moving it from Paisley Park to Iron Mountain in LA? Hmm, I could say a lot of things about that. I, you know, I looked at those gaudy pictures that they released, had to release after that, and um, I looked at the vault ones, and it looked exactly like it looked when I left 20 years before the fact. There's even that, you know, uh, before he closed the place to the public, it was very well archived. They, the ladies upstairs took great care to have it all in there. Every, it was, you know, we had to fill in lots of uh, work orders, which I actually did till the end of my day there. It's like all the credits, what you needed, what was done on what day, and blah, blah, blah. It's, it was all in there. And that died, you know, I think couple of months into my tenure and it's still in there um, and I think you know there are people like Dylan for example who just gave his estate stuff to a university which I think is just an amazingly smart move to give it to the right people uh, where you know okay they can do something where they do it right and he just never did that and there were some gruesome moments with tape where I begged him to let me put it all into the vault and do something with it. And eventually he did. But moisture was involved and whatever. So I think it's actually a really good idea they took it out there. Um, yeah, I don't want to go too deep because I had a couple ideas which I did um, communicate. But th that that is a very good solution. These people know what they're doing. That's a place that's just um, made for stuff like that. Um, you know, another place would have been here in uh, at Abbey Road, in, uh, uh, the Abbey Road archives, which is people are just amazing and have huge experience with old tapes of all kinds and how to transfer them properly. And uh, you know, uh, the nothing compares to you that came out and stuff. It sounds good, so they they're doing a good job. I think that's a technically a very good decision. If it's a good one spiritually, I'll leave that up to other people. You know, I don't know if they could have built up the vault and put up people around it to transfer it maybe with people being able to look at it or whatever but uh, it's good for for the future of his music for sure what would you like to see happen regarding future projects and specifically around the eras that where it was albums that you worked on originally how would you like to see the estate curate that stuff and and work on it you know, it's a huge task, and I wouldn't wouldn't want to put. Oh, you should do this. You should do that on it. I think they, like I said, I think they did a made a really good decision to let good people digitize it and not let it sit around. And there are so many examples of people that were had much less time to be this prolific. You know, look at you know. I mean, you can still buy new Hendrix albums all the time, and I'm not even going to mention Tupac. You know. <laughs> But like stuff like um, uh, Dylan reissues or Zappa stuff, you know. So there are so many ways of doing it. I guess my real wish would be that all of the stuff he actually released would be available and even everywhere available and available in the same quality. So I have a huge remaster project, I think, would be a fabulous way to start it all. And not just the Warner Brothers stuff, but like everything else. And I'm not just talking about my stuff here. But like, uh, you know, what came after me, the little bits and bobs that came out, the little crazy little albums here and there and uh, all the videos and whatnot. So just have like a, his aura out there and people can go for it. And then you, you know, we'll all get, you know, I'll probably die over it. 
you may be a very old woman when the 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 last of it all comes out um but i keep saying you know there's two albums for everyone that was released on there so start saving up people to conclude the interview what would you say is the thing that you learned from working with prince and what is something that has always stuck with you till this day eat and sleep regularly people <laughs> it's good for your health uh, i've mentioned that before too but the thing that really struck me most about him was his complete disregard for circumstance if you wanted to do something and um, that really stuck with me that it's about keeping the flow of the artist going it's not about building a perfect house it's about building you know handing the tools to the person doing it in my my world that's my job um, I guess and on a personal level as you know it's it was so intense that I I can think of I can't think of any occasion where I was I was stressed really after that. I mean there were a couple of stressful situations of course, but none to the effect that I had on a weekly basis at least with Prince. So it just kind of prepared me for life. That wraps everything up. That's been another episode of Uncovering Prince. Massive shout out Hans Martin Buff. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a phenomenal interview. As with every episode that we try and do with the series, we try and learn new things about Prince because there are so many new things to learn from everybody that had any kind of interaction with him. You, know, you learn something new and that's, that's the aim, I think, because we always say in, when he was here, like you only saw the things that he wanted you to see as fans. And uh, you know, now the mo one of the most important things for his legacy is that we try and understand him a little bit more. Um, so thank you so much for, for helping us to do that. My pleasure. Thank cool. you. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, The Violet Reality on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. And we'll catch you next time for more Uncovering Prince. Bye. Bye. Oh, also, shout out to Proud Galleries. Yes. Hosting this interview, <laughs> Proud Galleries, where Steve Park did his exhibition. Got Steve's photos here. Come, if you're in London, come to Proud Galleries. Check it out. All right, bye -bye. All right guys. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye.